I am very happy to be back here in New England and to relive several moments of great joy that I had when I went to school on both sides of the Charles River in Cambridge and Boston studying for public administration in the then School of Government in Litauer Center, now called the John F. Kennedy School of Government and in the Harvard Business School in Boston across the river. It's very nice to be back here and to meet so many old friends and some new ones. Is there anybody in this audience who has never heard me before? Please raise your hands. Thank you. Is there anybody here who has heard me before? <laughs> Thank you. Is there anybody who is not sure? <laughs> Thank you. I, I do not ask this question in real facetious manner like it looks. I ask this question because our basic problem in life is a problem of uncertainty, not being sure. So when I address this question to you, I'm really addressing a much larger question. Are you really sure of what you are doing? Are you really sure what you are here for? Are you really sure what this life is all about? Are you really sure why we are alive? and human. Are you really sure why we ought to be sure? <clears throat> Is there something in us as human beings that shows us the way, that shows us which side we should be moving, that gives an indication that we are here for a purpose? And that purpose is what makes us alive, what makes us have values, what makes us have the breath of life, and what shows a direction? Or have we forgotten all that? If we have forgotten, we surely need to find out what we should be sure about. What is the business of being here? What is it that makes our experience experienceable? It is consciousness. Any unconscious experience, any subconscious experience, may be an experience, we don't know anything about it. We can only talk about an experience when it becomes conscious. It comes into our awareness. Therefore, our awareness, our consciousness is the key to what we can do with our life here. We are here because we know we are here. And we know we are here because we are conscious of our place in this life. There may be a lot of things going on. We don't know about it. But what we know about is our life. Therefore, this consciousness, this awareness that makes us alive, that makes us know our own position in life, is the key to our own being, to our own identity. If we were not conscious, we could have no identity at all. And this consciousness gives us an identity. Now, what is our identity? If we can find out what our true identity is as conscious beings, we would know why we are here. Unfortunately, we are not sure. I hasten to add that I have no right to speak for everybody, but I speak for a majority of people I meet during my round the world tours. And they are not quite sure. When I came in the 60s to study at this prestigious university here, I was surprised it was an honor to start a lecture with the words, maybe, perhaps. It shows scholarly acumen that you are not making any dogmatic statements. That you are starting with a sense of uncertainty and maybes and perhapses was the degree, was a mark of your learning and scholarship. That if you just made state statements, this means you are dogmatic. You are not leaving room for other opinions and other, op other options. Of course, a lot of things that happen is then and people have become more certain over certain things. A lot of scientific research has shown us that we are limiting ourselves by certain screens that we put around ourselves. A thought comes to me about the movies that we visit. We go to a movie to see something happening on a screen. We sit in the audience and watch the movie on the screen and a lot of things are happening we don't like. Sometimes we cry. 
Sometimes tears come in our eyes. Sometimes we sit on the edge of our chair. Sometimes all kinds of emotional things happen to us and we look at the screen and we do not move and do not run and tear up the screen in order to change the things that are happening there. We stay in our seats. We paid seven dollars to watch it. But when it comes to the screen of life of human consciousness, when we watch the show going on to the screen, we run out to tear up the screen. Not realizing that this screen in which we see a movie does not provide any input into what is happening on it. What is happening is dependent upon what is in the film, in the tape, in the projector, which is behind us. The projector through which the light passes and throws those pictures, those moving pictures, it is what is loaded in the projector that will make any difference to what is happening on the screen. But in the screen of life, where we are projecting experiences outside, we try to mess up with the screen, hoping to make a change in our life. We do not even care to see where is the projector from where all this is being thrown out on the screen. The reason is the screen is a complicated one. In the case of the movie, the screen can be separated. If we wish to separate it, before the start of the movie, we say there is the screen. And then all the ads and the titles come up and the movie starts. We are given an opportunity to distinguish between the movie and the screen upon which it is being thrown. In life, the screen around us is more complicated, more complex. And we are not given adequate opportunity to see the screen before we start seeing the movie. What is the screen upon which the picture of life is being projected every day? and which blurs our vision and does not let us know where the projector is. This screen we have created in order to put our experience on the screen and the screen is called the screen of time, space and causation. We have been led to believe convincingly that there can be no happening if there is no time for that to happen. We have taken it for granted that there can be no happening unless there is time for it to happen. Therefore, time has become a given must for us to have any experience whatsoever. It is not true, but we have been made to believe it is true. We have been made to believe that unless there is space around us, there can be no happening. That all happening, all experience requires space. These three dimensions of space and the fourth dimension of time are being taken for granted. Then comes the fifth dimension of rationality or logical sequence. We are made to believe that nothing happens here in this time-space continuum unless there is a cause and effect relationship. That everything that happens here must have a cause. And whatever has a cause must lead to an event or to a happening. Don't you see the trap? That this is a screen upon which we are seeing our life. That we have bonded ourselves. That our experience of life is only possible if we see it through time, space and cause and effect relationship. That there is nothing possible outside of it. What has led to this bondage? How did we get trapped into this? We got trapped by misidentification of our own self. Instead of identifying ourselves with the soul, with consciousness per se, with the ability to be aware, instead of identifying our true self with the soul, we identified ourselves with the mind. The mind is the faculty that requires, by its very nature, the existence, the prior existence of time, space and causation before it can function. Mind is the machine that generates thoughts in us. There can be no thought unless there is any time available for thinking. There can be no thought unless space is available to express and experience that thought. There is no thought that does not become meaningful unless it fits into the rationality of cause and effect. This linear space, time and causation is holding us down to such an extent that we have convinced ourselves that we are no more 
than this machine called the mind. And that all things exist here because we are in the middle of a sequence going on. The time has been there before we came on. The world was always there. We came, got born here, and having been born, we're passing through series of events, all of them staged on time and space, having a cause and effect relationship, till we die, and the show ends. We have created a beautiful screen to watch our own life show on it. Okay, we did it. So what? We created a screen, we are seeing a show. But do we know we are seeing a show? If we had known what we were doing, if we knew all the time that we were just watching a show created from our consciousness upon a screen of time, space and causation, we would enjoy it. Irrespective of what the life would be like. Irrespective of whether we are rich or poor, whether we are sick or healthy, irrespective of what relationships happen, irrespective of the tragedies and the comedies of life, we would enjoy it. We would be willing, willing to buy a ticket to see the show. We are not content with seeing the show. We want to mess up with it. We want to tear up the screen. We want to tear up things that are happening around us. We don't want to sit on our chair from where we are watching the show of life. Where indeed are we watching the show of life from? So many enlightened people. People who had knowledge, direct personal knowledge, transcendental personal knowledge of how this show is taking place came and told us, this show takes place in the projector behind your eyes. It does not take place outside. You see it outside. You see it outside because you have to see it in a space created by you. We would not understand. Outside looks much more real than inside. What is this inside space behind the eyes? We close our eyes, it's so dark there. We do not know how to go inside. We only know outside. The outside looks so real. This screen has made this external world look so real that we have no option but to treat it as real and we have forgotten where the projection of this events of life is taking place from. We do not know how to go behind the eyes and see where is that projector. There are certain masters, certain enlightened people who know how to go behind the eyes and to see where consciousness is operating from. Where does awareness create this imagery, that imagery that comes out and is then picked up by our five senses outside. They know that place. They call it the third eye, the central part, the center, the tail, the seat of consciousness, the seat of soul and mind. They have described in many ways. The seat of soul and God. They have used every possible phrase they could to describe the creative power of the space behind our own human eyes. And that all the show we see outside is dependent upon what film has been loaded in the space behind the eyes. They make the statement. We have no way to verify it. We are busy with the projection outside on the screen. We do not know how to go back and change the tape if we don't like it. We are caught up in one tape. We don't know how to change it. And we are stuck with it. And we cry and we moan and we moan and do all kinds of things. And we go and tear up a screen of relationship with the rest of the world. As if that is going to make a change. Nothing changes. All the effort we make leads us to keep on playing more and more the role of a spectator of life, the drama of life that is taking place without our will. We have no control. Yet we try to use our control. We try to use our control in changing sequences that don't change. In trying to get happiness from areas where no happiness is coming from. In trying to find reality in things that are so obviously passing and temporary. There is something in us that talks of immortality. Something tells us that we are here to watch this whole show. That we have been watching it forever. That there is some part of us which must be immortal. On paper, we believe it, that the soul, our consciousness is immortal. And we have a feeling, a sense of it. Then how come we always look after things, run after things that are mortal, that are temporary? If our own basic nature is immortal, why are we constantly looking towards things that are mortal and temporary for our happiness? 
Why don't we look to our own immortality for our happiness? Because we do not know how to touch that part of ourselves where we are immortal. We only know the part around us which is temporary. Everything around us changes and whatever changes is temporary. We know nothing here in this world, nothing whatsoever that does not change. Therefore, there is nothing in this world that is permanent. Therefore, there is nothing in this world that is immortal. The only thing we suspect is immortal is the spectator, the witness who is watching these changes. That this one, the self, the true self watching these changes must be permanent. Because if this true self is not permanent and is watching these changes from a temporary position, there is no continuity in life itself. One being, one soul comes, looks at life, a portion of life and dies along with the body. Somebody else comes and starts another life. This creation is changing all the time. Therefore, there will be no immortality at all. And yet the belief is that there is some part of us which is totally immortal, that never dies. If there is some part of us that never dies, we should be able to access that part in order to find how the situation around us of change and temporariness has come about and why are we relying so heavily upon this temporary nature of events for our happiness. These enlightened people who saw the drama of life emanating from the seat of consciousness behind the eyes in the human body, they found that the human body had become alive because of consciousness which could open the eyes, open all the perceptions, open all the nine doors, the apertures on the body, look out and find a life and find a world outside. And they found that the tenth door was inside. The door which you could knock and find out how consciousness operated to create these experiences outside was inside. The tenth door. These nine doors opened outward and the tenth door opened inward. They again and again told us, you want to find the secret. You want to find the truth. Go and knock at the tenth door. It will open and you will see how it's happening. You will find your own immortality if you open the tenth door within. Instead of doing that, we are busy establishing contacts with the world to the nine openings on our body that all lead outward. This reversal of direction has created all the mess that we know of. I have not met one man or one woman in this world who could ascribe his or her unhappiness to any event other than an event relating to these nine apertures on the body. They were responsible for creating a relationship of unhappiness. And I have never come across any human being, anyone who is enlightened and has gone to the tenth door, not having happiness by knocking on the tenth door and finding the truth within. It's so obvious that all the unhappiness is outside and all the happiness is inside. And yet, we are running outside to seek that happiness which actually lies inside. This misdirected attention is the second big mistake that we have made and which makes us unsure of our own life. The first big mistake is that instead of identifying ourselves with the life force, with the soul, we are identifying ourselves with the mind and thinking that this machine, this computer that generates thoughts is ourselves. Big mistake and second big mistake is that we are thinking that these external scenes around us will provide happiness to us. They have never done it. They give temporary pleasures, temporary moments which look like happy moments and then the very things which are supposed to give happiness become the source of unhappiness. We go, fall in love, marry our spouses and with what fanfare, with what great joy. And it's what great expectation. This is heaven on earth. We found it. And after a few years, you see the same people in divorce courts. You see them crying. You see them killing each other. Wasn't that the same source of happiness that they were looking for? We produce babies and children. And we are so happy. These are angels come from heaven. And those angels grow up and become devils before they are so as big as this. 
isn't that the same source of happiness? We look at so many things around us and we think this will give us happiness and the same thing becomes the source of unhappiness. In this world, the external things are not giving us happiness. If you find happy people, <clears throat> they are happy with whatever is around them because of what they have found inside themselves. Happiness and contentment has come from within, not from outside. These people who are seeking happiness outside sometimes are misled by some very good actors amongst us. We have a fraternity of good actors who put up a good appearance. People are there, rich, living in nice mansions. They must be happy. Go and spend a week with them. You come back home. Oh, my God, nobody is unha as unhappy as they are. The people married with children, they are a happy family. Go and live three days with them. You run away from them. Never saw so much unhappiness and fights and quarrels amongst them. We hide some of these things. But the truth is, nobody is happy with the things of this world. And we are still trying to search ourselves, search our happiness from the things of this world. Why are, why are these things of this world and why are these people of this world making us unhappy? The reason is very simple. That our relationship with the things of this world and the people of this world is based upon desire. And desire leads to attachment. And attachment eventually leads to, leads to unhappiness. It's a very simple linear logic that we are relying upon. That linear logic makes us desire things of this world. In order to fulfill the desires, we create attachments. Those attachments rebound upon us at some point or the other and give us unhappiness. Well, if this is true, in the quest for happiness, one should be able to find an easy way. Don't be attached. Don't have desires. Make it simple. It is not so simple. Because when we want to fight attachment, we get more attached. This is the nature of our mind. The nature of the mind, which is quite different from the nature of our soul. I want to draw this distinction because we are mixing this up. This misidentification is responsible for our plight. So I'll come back to it again. How we are basically units of consciousness, of soul, not units of time and space, which is the mind. But we identify ourselves with the mind and hence all our ills and unhappiness. When we try to make things our own, we forget our immortality and the mortality and temporary nature of the things. Here people have spent so much of their time. People have spent so much of their energy and attention on acquiring things. We go to people's homes. Oh, I collected all these things. I've got a nice car. It's parked there. I've got a second one now. And look at all my wall paintings. And look at these little, small little trinkets I've put all over. You gather all these trinkets. And then suddenly you can't breathe anymore. And the trinkets can do nothing for you. All these things are lying there. None of them can give you one extra breath and you die and they can do nothing for you. All those people, you say, they are my friends, they are my children, they are my parents, my brothers, they are mine, mine, mine. When the last breath comes, none of them is yours. They cannot help you at all. And there is nobody immortal here. We all die in this body. And all our relationships, all these acquisitions, all this desire to possess things and make them our own, are all temporary things outside. None of them go with us. Alexander the Great, when he conquered so many countries and he went out to India and he conquered several parts of it, he destroyed several temples, gathered gold and diamonds and all the jewelry, all the wealthy things and put into bags and sacks were loaded onto his camels and horses and on his way back he died. He could not reach his own capital. And he said, I'm willing to give all this wealth I have killed people. I have made so many children orphans and made so many women widows in order to acquire all this. Won't this help me? Is there no doctor, no physician that can give me a few more days? I can reach home. And they said, no, your last moment has come. Nobody can help you. He said, not all this property, all this acquisition that I have. They said, no. So he gave an instruction on his tomb, if you see Alexander's tomb. He's Given instruction, my hand is outside. He, left. he said, leave my hand outside of the coffin. 
So people in the future should know that even Alexander the Great had to leave empty handed. Nothing would go with him. We have all this history before us and yet every day we are trying to acquire these little trinkets of this world and they don't give us permanent happiness. And all the time we know that there is something in us that can give us permanent happiness and lies within. And we don't search for that. There is a search going on within us. But that search is misdirected. We are unsure. We are not certain how to proceed with that search. The search comes from deep recess of our consciousness. Somewhere deep into our hearts if we look, there is something searching. There is some part of us, each one of us. I have not seen an exception. If there is an exception, please tell me. Each one of us wants to find a true companionship, a true solution to loneliness, true love. Every one of us wants to find it. This thirst is so universal and comes from such a deep part of us that we, in order to quench that thirst, to overcome our loneliness and to seek true love that will last and tell us we are not alone. In order to get the reassurance, we are not alone. We go all over the world searching for things and companionship. That is the real motivation. The motivation for going out on the adventure of this life and of, of this world to acquire things and to make friendships and to make relationships is to overcome our loneliness. It doesn't take too long to find out that the relationship with the world is skin deep. The relationship with the world is not reaching out to that part where the loneliness exists. The loneliness exists right in, the, in our inner being. The inner being is lonely. Each one of us has this experience. And we are trying to combat this loneliness by going outside to meet people who look so unreal. If a person is really in love, he can see the unreality of this world. If you are not really in love, just li living a superficial life like actors on the stage, the world looks a great social party. You can have a big party here. But if you are looking for real love, you will find this world is very empty. And nobody is real. You talk to people, they will talk nicely, they will talk very cleverly, but they will not touch you where you are lonely. Because where you are lonely is your soul, not your thoughts. Where you are lonely, is your inner consciousness, not your desires, not your senses, not your external experiences. They are not lonely. The lonely part is the one which is the truth. It is lonely by its very immortality. People talk of one God. There is only one God. Have you heard that? I want to get reaffirmation. Have you heard there is only one God? Please raise your hand if you are sure there is only one God. If you are sure, don't you realize he'll be very lonely? Loneliness starts from the creator. Lonely start, loneliness starts from truth. Loneliness starts from the very fact there is only one consciousness. It is the one consciousness and the loneliness of the one consciousness that justifies creation. That justifies the many. Even if the many are illusion, even if the many are on a screen, it justifies the creation of the many because of the loneliness of the one. It is a basic nature of that oneness. And that basic nature shows how we participate in the consciousness or the essence of the creator. A human being is made in the image of the creator. We heard that. What does it mean? In what way are we similar? Does the creator also have eyes and nose and ears like us? Does the creator is tall and short like us? Does he have a skin like us? We never heard of that. If there is something that looks similar to the creator, it's an inner loneliness, that oneness, it does not go away. That only one exists would be a common feature. The second common feature would be only one exists and does not want to be one. There is nothing else in this world that can make a free choice on this issue of oneness and loneliness except the creator and a human being. I've tried to look around, is there anybody else, any living form 
that tries to make a free will decision a decision out of its free choice i don't want to be lonely i want to set up something even if it is not true even if it is not real it should not be alone only two beings in this whole creation make the choice the creator who set up the creation to overcome his loneliness and the human being who is trying to overcome the loneliness by companionship of this world there's nobody else doing it that makes us in the image of the creator this discernment this ability to know our loneliness and to overcome it by use of free choice free will this will is the real word we talk of will all the time we want to live in his will there must be another will if we are instructed to live in his will and we want to live in his will what other will is there if the creator set up the whole show for us just to go through it and left no other will there would be no point in saying we want to live in his will there would be no purpose served by constantly reminding ourselves lord what is your will i want to live in your will that means besides his will there is some other will also that we have created here sure we have and that is the will of the mind is the will of the computer here is an operator of the computer there is a computer responding of course the computer responds to what we feed into it whatever we feed into our mind the mind creates a will of its own and that disturbs us because when the mind wills something it is never sure of its will that's a great thing i'm making a big statement i want you to examine it that every time our human mind the thinking machine makes a decision out of its will it is not sure if it is right or wrong if the mind says i am sure this is like this you discuss a little more with the mind and you say i know i am not so sure if you want to make a person who is very certain on his mental beliefs become uncertain discuss a little more with that person the doubts come so quickly the reason why the mind gets into doubt so quickly is that the mind employs mechanically a rule of logic to come to its decision which leaves room for doubt all the time the mechanics of thinking the mechanics of rationalization itself is built with doubts into it doubts are a part of the mechanical process of reasoning when we talk of reasoning we employ what these logicians call the deductive and inductive logic that's the only way we function the mind uses deductive logic <clears throat> deductive logic is very interesting it says this wall is white therefore this small little section is part of the wall therefore this small little section is also white who is the wiser by saying this we are doing this all the time in deductive logic we take what is our experience perception perception of something we examine a part of that experience by analysis and declare we know it has the same property that the whole had this is the only syllogistic deductive logic that we ever learned but there's another logic that we use also called the inductive logic <clears throat> in that inductive logic says this whole wall is white it turns a corner i don't see any reason why it should not be white so probably it is white on the other side that leaves doubt every inductive inference that we make through our mental reasoning leaves doubt every deductive reasoning that we make gives no new knowledge therefore whenever we use our mind either we are left where we were or we are filled with doubt there is no solution to this if we use the mind for knowledge we will never get certainty and if we are left with some doubt then the benefit of the doubt comes to us and we are filled with fear that's the benefit of doubt whoever has doubt is also got fear i have not seen a person who has a doubt having any fear because fear basically another characteristic of our life of our unhappy life fear is based upon the unknown we don't know something doubt is what says you don't know doubt translated into common man's language is you don't know it could be something else that's why you have doubt if you were sure you wouldn't have doubt since you have doubt therefore you are afraid we don't know what will happen now in this game 
that we are playing with the world and with our life, we come across beautiful experiences of our own soul, which are not experiences of thought. Experiences such as the experience of love. We see somebody that filled with love. We forget ourselves. The beloved fills us. It's such a great feeling. It's an uplifting feeling. Love fills us. Gives us a joy we never had again. It's a soul experience. It's a spiritual experience. Love is always a spiritual experience. When it comes, what do we do with it? Because we have a machine with us, the mind, because we have the logical machine, we apply it. Check it out. The machine says, are you sure? Are you sure about this person? Are you sure this will go? Is it not something? Is there a con game going on? The, that experience is destroyed. We destroy our spiritual experience of our own soul by using this mind and the doubt that it generates. Take another example. Another spiritual experience we all get because of our consciousness is an ability to know instantly whatever is in consciousness, which we call intuition. A sudden burst of knowledge, a sudden burst of an intimation of what is going to happen for which there is no reason. A sudden irrational knowing of something. The intuitive process. When intuitively we know something, we are very happy. We just know it. Somebody says, how do you know it? I don't know how, but I know it. That gut feeling, that knowledge that comes instantly is such a great human experience. It's one of the greatest human experiences showing the existence of a soul that can pick up an experience like that. What do we do with that experience? We say, where's our machine, thinking machine? Where is our mind? And we apply the mind to it. It says, are you sure? Oh, this may be just a hunch. Who knows? They don't always come out true. And we destroy the very experience. Look at another example. The joy of opening the window and looking at a beautiful scene of the sea. Or looking at a painting on the wall and taking in the beauty and joy of the painting. What a beautiful experience. What a spiritual experience. What a great human spiritual experience to be able to have that ecstatic moment just by having the joy of a beautiful thing. The thing of beauty is a joy forever, as Keats said, and we get that feeling. Then what destroys that joy forever? We start analyzing. Let me see, is this piece, is this tree giving the beauty? Is that section giving the beauty? We start analyzing, the beauty is no longer there, the joy is gone. What have we done to ourselves? This computer was given to us to help us. And we are destroying our joy and our happiness by applying it. This mind was given to help us. This mind is a great machine. It's one of the best machines. All computers that we have made in this world are a poor copy of this computer. And we are misusing it. Why are we misusing our mind? Because we are not treating it like a machine. We are treating it like our own self. We have forgotten who we are. And we think this thinking thing is ourselves. I haven't heard people talk recently to me. My mind thinks like this. But I know like that. People say, I think like this. How can you think like this? Because you are not thoughts. Thoughts are an adjunct to spiritual life. Your spiritual life is the one that just provides the awareness, the consciousness. To thoughts, to senses, to everything else. The motive force, the life force that makes all these things happen is your soul, yourself. How can one section of it be yourself? But by misidentifying ourselves with our minds, we create all these problems. So this quest of the soul and search for an answer to this problem of unhappiness has been the subject of all the teachings of the great masters and the saints and the holy people who have come in every part of the world. More so in the East, because the East has very, for many centuries, been the front face of the earth, planet earth. According to recent predictions, the earth is changing a spiritual axis. According to some known facts, the earth has changed its magnetic axis in the past. According to some known facts, the earth has changed its continents. There has been a shift of the axis. But right now what we are watching is a 
term of the spiritual axis. This part of the earth where we are now sitting and sharing this information has been the back of the earth, almost the backbone of the earth. People put their backs to the wall to work and generate happiness through affluence. And the spiritual happiness that the saints and mystics talked about were coming from the East. Apparently things are changing. The Eastern countries where all the masters came and spoke of spirituality are busy making money. They want more refrigerators, more cars. They say God's grace has come to us, we build a bigger house now. They never used to talk like that. God's grace has come, our bank balance has gone up. Those countries where spiritual contentment was a way of life are now building more factories, more industries and looking for more affluence and printing more green, green backs. And this country which has seen affluence, these parts of the world, the planet, is now looking for true happiness, having found that true happiness could not come from materialistic advancement. So surely there is a shift taking place. My own master, a great teacher, a great master, he told me more than 50, 60 years ago that one day the spiritual axis will shift. And this spirituality which seems to be taking hold of the East all these centuries will go over to the West. I believe him. I saw signs of it early on, 30, 40 years ago. I saw signs of it when I came to study in the university in Boston. I saw signs of it when I came to work in New York with the United Nations Children's Fund. I see signs of it today. That is why I emigrated here. I emigrated and became a US citizen to sit here, not to get the affluence of this place, but to pick up a ringside seat on this great drama of spirituality that's unraveling here. It's a great, great show here, that here is a place on the planet, on this side, which is now taking the same interest in terms of seeking, in terms of search which seems to have been the historical prerogative of the East. I come here and I find people are so earnest in seeking the truth. They are willing to explore all this. They are moving themselves away from the shackles of tradition and culture which held them down. There are true seekers. Wherever there are true seekers, there are true masters. Masters are not coming here for their own sake. They come for the sake of the seekers. If you seek, you will find a master. You don't have to find a master. The master finds you. You have to seek. You don't have to seek a master. You have to seek a truth. Seek the truth. Wherever people seek the truth, masters appear in their midst. This has been the tradition all over the world. These masters, if they do not know where the seekers are, they are no masters. If I seek in my heart and the master cannot hear me, the Lord does not hear me and sends the master to help me. It's not a master nor is there a Lord. If the truth is within, if God is within us, surely he should be able to hear every whisper that we have in our heart. We don't have to be shouting outside. My experience shows that these perfect living masters that we find in history and in contemporary world, they have appeared where there are seekers. And seeking is the key. We are like a bunch of blind people put into a hall with no windows and doors. And the only door there is, is flush with the wall. And we are moving around trying to find the door to get out. Being blind, we cannot see anything. And we are all sharing with each other how we'll one day find the door. Or how we'll find, a, find one day somebody with eyes who can tell us where the door is. We have no eyes to see who has the eyes. Supposing in this hall, in which blind people are moving all over, groping against the wall to find the door, a man with eyes walks in. He will see what they are doing. If he does not see what they are doing, he doesn't have eyes either. They are trying to seek a way out. If he finds somebody has gone round and round too much, and the seeking is intense, and that person comes and puts his hands in front of that person and says, come on, I'll take you out. We don't say that the one with eyes has found us. We say, we have found the one who eyes. We knew one day we will find. We found it. This is our story. In spite of the fact that we are blind, we still think that we are the ones who find the one with eyes. If we could find, we have eyes already. We don't need a person. 
we need somebody to give us this guidance because we don't have that vision to see. And that person has the vision to see. And when he can see, he can take us to the door and show us the way. This has happened throughout history and is happening now. Wherever there are seekers who cannot see, one who can see comes in their midst to take them out. This is the basic law through which we are here. Why are we so many souls if there is only one creator? We are so many souls because of the experience of the many. And if the experience of the many is pain painful, is not happy for us, surely there must be a way to go back to the one. How could the one take a chance of becoming the many and not leave scope for us to find the way back to the one? This is a built-in system in us. The spiritual path which these masters, enlightened people come and tell us is not invented by them. It is natural to us. It is placed in each one of us. The spiritual path is not a man-made creation. The spiritual path, the path towards discovery of your own self, the discovery of the oneness in yourself and the show of the many that is taking place which should be giving you intense happiness. This spiritual path is inside us and has been created by the same creator who created us. It is not the prerogative of any particular race or any particular person or any particular nationality or any particular color of a skin. It's open to everybody. That consciousness is in each one of us. Therefore, the creator of that consciousness is also in each one of us. If this body is the temple of the living creator, Everybody must be the temple of the living creator. There is no, no distinction made here. Therefore, the search for the truth must go within our own self. We do not know how to go inside. That's the only reason that I have been able to find why these masters became human and walked upon this earth. Why should there be a master? Why shouldn't the master give us a call from inside and say, come? I am your guide, I am speaking to you from inside. I live in the Himalayas. And from there I am speaking from an inner voice to you and telling you to come. That's good enough. In fact, it's not good enough. Because we have such trained mind that can create these voices whenever you like. Our mind is so creative, it can create any voice that it likes. The mind can create these kind of voices and does create these voices all the time. Therefore, people have failed to get any salvation when they picked up a teacher, a guide, who was not a perfect living human being, a perfect living human being who was enlightened with the knowledge of what is going inside. Some people say, well, nature is a great teacher. Why not go to nature? They go into the forest, look at the trees, the plants talk to them, the birds chirp and give them a message. I have gone with these people too. I have had my nature walks with them and they understand the language of the birds and the eagles flying. And I also try to understand. I said, what is this bird saying? He said, the bird is telling us that the Lord is taking care of us. I said, the bird is telling me I have no bank account. Do you hear that? Because when I first came to this country, they said, do you have any money to live here? I said, no, I came on four dollars. How didn't it worry you? Then I looked at a bird sitting. This happened right here. It happened in, in Cambridge. I said, that bird doesn't have a bank account. And doesn't seem to be worried. That's the lesson I learned. You are hearing something else. I am hearing something else. Don't you see both these statements are being made by our own mind. The bird is saying nothing. Our mind is telling us what the bird is saying. Well, we can go to boats and horses and cows. However holy the cow might be, the cow doesn't speak, the mind speaks. We can go to trees, clouds, ideas, books. They don't speak, we speak, our mind speaks. How can there be truth in any of these things if the, our own mind is speaking the language of all these people? Only a human being, a friend, a true friend in a human body, with a human mind, with a human soul, like ourselves, can tell us, no, that's your mind. Not God speaking. Therefore, there is no possibility of getting true guidance from anywhere else outside of ourselves except the perfect living master in a human form. 
It does not mean that the truth is within. The truth is still with us. The truth is inside. The master is inside. God is inside. Everything is inside. We don't know how to go in. Therefore, he becomes relevant to us. The human being who has attained this awareness, who has got enlightened, is relevant to us only for the reason that we don't know how to go with it. We are trapped by our mind. We take whatever the mind gives as granted. Take it for granted. That's why we are in this position. And we need the guidance of somebody who can tell us this is wrong. Don't follow it. Look for yourself. These perfect living masters, when they come into our life, they come in a strange way. I have never seen any friend of mine coming into my life the way they come. They come not because you're looking for them. They come because you're seeking the truth in your own heart. They come through coincidence. They come through the most remarkable of strange experiences. They go for something else and they are, they are at the corner. Street corner, you meet them. You meet them in the strangest places. They come when we are seeking the truth and haven't spoken about it. They respond to our unspoken need, our unspoken seeking. They respond to seeking and nothing else. If they do not come, when we are seeking, they are no masters. If they cannot know we are seeking, they cannot help us anymore. Remember this. We don't have to talk to them and tell them what we are seeking. We have to seek and they will tell us what to do next. It's a great experience. Don't be misled by a lot of people who say they are gurus. They are masters. In fact, my master, great master used to say, in this world there are more gurus than disciples. We have a problem of finding good disciples. Gurus you find all over, they made the business. The true masters do not come to take anything from us. They don't make it a business. They come to give us. Their love is so overpowering. It goes right into our hearts. Their impact upon us is not based upon what they say. It's the impact is based upon what we are seeking at that time. How it relates to the seeking. So their coming into our life is a great adventure on the spiritual path. It's not based upon any worldly trade or, or uh, transaction taking place. So we have a lot of fake gurus going around and we should not look around and try to judge who is a real one or who is not a real one. We should concentrate on seeking within ourselves and when we seek, we will be found. That's what the Sanskrit adage says, when the chela is ready, the guru appears. It does not say when the chela is ready, you will find a guru. The guru appears, he appears, the teacher appears when the student is ready. Ready means ready in the seeking. The truth is inside. The real form of the perfect living master is also spiritual and inside. The spiritual master is never outside, it's always inside us. We do not know how to access the spiritual master inside. Therefore, we get help from somebody who is outside. And that help is temporary till we find the truth inside. These perfect living masters don't come and say, follow us and we'll take you outside somewhere. We'll take you to various shrines. We'll give you dips in many rivers. Will take you to different kind of temples. They don't tell you that. If they do, they are not perfect living masters. They tell you, go within your own self and find the truth. They tell us, if you want to find our own true nature, go within your own self and find the true nature. You want to find a real friend? The real friend is inside you, not outside. They take the form and they take the language which suits us outside. But their real language and their real form is inside our own self. As we progress on the spiritual path, we begin to find what their reality is. They do not make a claim that we are gurus. We are masters. We come up with all this knowledge. They make no claim. They say we are just ordinary people like you, but we have got some nice experiences. Maybe you can try and get them too. When we ask them, Master, but what is your real nature? Aren't you a real master? I don't know. You can take me as a brother. You can take me as a friend. You can take me as anything. You can take me as Mr. So-and-so. But go in. When you see him inside, then you can call me what you like. Their humility is amazing. This is the nature of the true masters. But since there are so many fakes who talk differently, don't be misled by them. The truth is within and will always be found within. But they help us to let us see how we can go within. They know that from birth, in this human body, our attention has been flowing outwards. 
through desire and attachment, through the sensory systems. We have thrown our attention to external things all the time. When we want to meditate upon our own self, when we want to close our eyes and withdraw attention to our own self, these very attachments, they come in front of us and draw the attention outside again. They know our weakness. They know all our life, our attention has flown in one direction, has been going out outside. It's a big task to reverse this direction and to put the same attention inward. They don't come and teach us how to focus your attention on something. Because we have been focusing attention all our life. They come to tell us how not to focus your attention. But to withdraw it to the very source from where it came, which is your own self, your own spiritual self. Withdrawal of attention to one's own self is something quite different from focusing it inside or outside or anywhere. When you focus your attention anywhere, inside or outside, it is away from yourself. The focus is not yourself. Withdrawing attention to your own self is not focusing attention and that is self-realization. We don't know how to do it. These masters have mastered this art. They've done it themselves. That is their only qualification. The qualification of a perfect living master, a spiritual teacher, is not how many degrees he has, how many books he has written or read, what universities he has attended, what schools he has attended, how high, how tall or short he is, what build, what build he has, what clothes he wears, what sp language he speaks. None of these are relevant. The only thing relevant in judging if a master is qualified or not is, does he have the same experience himself which he teaches us? If he has, he's a master. If he doesn't, he's just a learned man who will give us nothing. It's not books and learning and words that give us this thing. Books and learning and words have already kept us outside. They've drawn our attention outside. How can they give us something as a cue for what is within our own self? Only one who has experienced this can tell us how to go with it. Tomorrow we have a workshop where we will experiment with some of the ways that the masters have taught us how to go with it. Tomorrow we'll explore the space where we don't need to speak, where the unspoken language holds power. All the spoken languages of the world have a history. Every language you can trace the history. In fact, there's a nice literature on this in the Widener Library here in Cambridge. I studied here showing the history of every language of the world. There's no language not tackled there. Some languages started 500 years ago. Some started 1,000 years ago, some 5,000, 8,000, 10,000 years. Uh, we don't have any language that is older than 10,000 years. Surely this world is not 10,000 years old. It's been millions of years old. These languages have been evolved. The spoken languages have been evolved for our convenience from time to time. How could the truth, how could the true word be written out in this kind of a language? How could the immortal truth of our own spirit be recorded in a language which has such a short history. The language that records the truth is not made of these words. It's not a spoken language. It's not a written language. What can be written and spoken is not the language in which truth is recorded. And yet, truth is recorded. And truth can be heard, can be seen. If truth is recorded and has been seen, what kind of language is that? That language is the truth has been recorded has been referred to in every culture, every tradition, every religion of this world as the language that created the whole universe and the whole experience of this universe. St. John's opening verse in the Gospel says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What word was it? English? Hebrew? Spanish? These languages have very little history. What word was there? Could it be a spoken word at all? Yet that word was the creator of all things. It could not be published. It was right in the beginning. The Bible is not that old. The Bible has only a couple of thousand years history. But the Sanskrit Vedas, the Rig Veda, has a much older history. It existed before the Buddha came on this, on this earth. The Buddhists refer to the Vedas as old books. And they were there at 500 BC. In 500 BC, they have reference to books which are very old at that time. 
in the oldest of the old books, the Rig Veda, its opening sentences, in the beginning was the Nard, the sound that created all things. What kind of sound? What kind of word, what kind of sound can be the creator of everything? Has no history. Has always been there and is still there. How can we have access to that kind of a word? These perfect living masters who have had access to that word tell us, there is a word, there is a sound, there is a music, there is a resonance, there is a rhythm inside each one of us which is no spoken language and cannot be read and recorded anywhere, yet can be heard by every one of us. Here is an audible proof that there is in consciousness itself, in the immortal soul, in the immortal consciousness, there is an audible part of resonance which can be heard but not recorded, which can be heard but not written down and cannot be spoken. Every culture has referred to that great resonance and the great music of the spheres that revolves or creates the whole experience. That great music was not invented by any man. Sometimes in my workshops, people for the first time say, we hear some bells ringing. They're so confusing, they want to see if somebody really rang the bells. Well, those bells are ringing in each one of us. Did you know that? In each one of us, bells are ringing 24 hours all the time. Great bells are ringing. That sound has not been produced by human being and put into our heads. There is no tape recorder there. That sound has come along with our life. The body may go away, the sound does not go away. This body dies and becomes dust and the sound and the soul, the consciousness does not die. That sound goes along with the consciousness and that can be heard. The fact that there is a resonance in our own self, not in our mind, but in our own spirit is a great way to discover the spiritual way. If there is a sound, there is something that can be heard within our own soul, within our own consciousness, the path becomes easy. Instead of focusing on something, listen to yourself. If you can listen to your own self, you are on the spiritual path. I tell you a very small distinction between your mind and your soul. What speaks in your head is your mind. What listens is your soul. The soul is the listener. The listening post has created all the experiences around us. Nothing becomes meaningful unless the listener in us is told what's going on. The mind as a constant narrator of events has made life meaningful. The interpretation of what is happening around us is being given by the mind and made available to the listening soul. This distinction is so strong and so powerful that people have altered and transformed their life just by understanding this little part. If you become a great speaker and keep on speaking, you'll make a mess of your life. If you listen, you'll make your life happy. In any aspect, go and try. The more you become a listener, the happier you'll become. The more you start speaking. I have very interesting experiences traveling in a plane or in a bus or in a train and seeing people speaking in the front seat or the front row or just on next to me. And I just, oh, it's not proper, but sometimes I eavesdrop a little. What are they saying? The surprising thing is two people are speaking, both are speaking at the same time. Obviously, they, don't, they, don't, they have so much to say. They don't give a chance to the other person to say and they hear. They have so much to say, they keep on saying. Sometimes I am amused, they are talking on two different subjects. And they spend hours together on the journey, they enjoy. Oh, we are so pleased. At the end, they get up. Such a lovely thing to meet you and to talk with you. They talk with nobody except themselves. We have this habit of talking all the time. We have, and that's creating our problems. We are talking. If there's nobody to listen, we start talking in our head. Thinking is a way of talking. Because we think in words. We think in temporary words of spoken languages. We think in these spoken languages and we crowd our head with those spoken words and these spoken words make us tell us, I never expected him to do that. I wish I had done this. I wish I had not done this. All the terror, all the grief, all the revenge, all the anger comes out because we speak. 
You stop speaking in your head and start listening. All your anger will disappear. You become a cool person. Did you know that all these angry emotions are coming because we speak so much in our head? We think too much. We listen too little and think too much. That's the bane of our society, the bane of our life. On the spiritual path, you have to be a listener in order to access your own self. One mystic says, if you can just keep quiet in your head and listen, you'll find the truth. I think he's right. If we can stop the babble of our own mind in the head and start listening to the resonance of our own soul, we found the way. So that inner music, that great Shabbat, that great Naam, that great Holy Ghost, that great connection between us and every state of consciousness that is in each one of us, which is a gift from the Creator, that is really the spiritual way and connects us to the truth. We don't know how to find it. So when somebody who has got it shares with us, we call that person a perfect living master. I want to tell you we are very lucky that we have perfect living masters and have had them in every part of the world, in every society, contemporary and past and future, wherever there are seekers. That creator is not so unjust as to say that this truth will be reserved for some people and not for all. Whoever is a seeker, find the truth. And we'll be able to explore something more about this inner space where the truth can be found when we meet for workshop. How many of you are coming to the workshop tomorrow? Thank you. I'll welcome you tomorrow. For the others, if you have any questions, I'll be ready to answer them now. Thank you very much. Yes. Tell us of the ages of mankind. Say it again. Tell us of the ages of mankind. You mean the four ages of man? Is that your reference? The age of Pisces. Okay, you tell us. We're going into the age of Aquarius. What's the age of Aquarius? Tell us about What is this new age we're entering into? Well, they said it is the age of spiritual revelation and spiritual resurgence of our spiritual seeking in a big way. We are entering that age now. What the past ages were are not relevant to us. What is relevant is the new age of Aquarius we are entering, in which we have greater opportunity for spiritual knowing than ever before. It only means that our chances of finding the truth are greater now. It does not mean that all of us will find it. But the chances of finding are greater now. Yes. How do you relate the reality of the world to spirituality? I mean, I try to do that. I try to figure it out um, what I can. Um, but then we have so people in Rwanda today. I can't either. Yeah, they are not they're too much. They are not spiritual things. I can't seem to connect that to the spirituality in the world. It's very difficult to connect uh, these painful experiences and tragedies taking place with spirituality, except in one sense. And that is, if none of these tragic things were happening anywhere else, would we know how lucky we are that we are not in that tragic situation? Or do we only know of our own bliss from the misery that exists somewhere else? It's a very subtle point. So subtle that I normally not touch upon it. But since you have asked it, I must tell you that the truth is that all our experiences in this world are based upon pairs of opposites. If we can see this light today in this room, we can see it because we can switch it off and see darkness. If there was no switch to turn this light off, we would be unaware of the light existing here. Therefore, every experience in this world is being generated as an experience meaningful to us by an opposite experience taking place also in the same universe. So the pain and pleasure are going together and the disasters and the bliss are going together and different situations which juxtapose as opposites are taking place together and one tells us the value of the other. We are so built. In this physical world we are built like this that we can only have an experience of which the opposite exists. So, from that point of view, in a subtle way, there is some relevance. I don't say justification. Some relevance for some experiences that give us pain and distress. And we can see the opposite of it, which could be blissful. Still, people are not willing to condone the creator. That just for the sake of creating opposites, they're creating so much pain. But there's a subtle answer to that too. If you go to sleep, 
and have a nightmare, a very dreadful nightmare. You see a lot of people being killed and you are horrified by what's happening. It's so terrible what people are doing and you wake up. You say, at least thank God it was just a dream. Nobody was really killed. So you feel happy that the whole thing happened in a dream state and not in real state. Maybe what we are seeing here is from the point of view of the creator a mere dream state. If it is a dream state, we, awake, we may awaken one day to find nothing of this whatever happened. That it happened for a purpose, for a lesson in a state of lower consciousness. in their consciousness of those people who are suffering with devastation. That is a very strange thing. That's a very good question you have asked. And I made a special study of this question. What happens to the person who looks to us to be in a terrible misery? We go to that person. The best person to answer that question is that person. So go to that person and that person often says, I am in tranquil contentment. Looks funny. I come from the third world where there is intense poverty, poverty that I cannot stand. I have to close my eyes that I cannot bear it. I should be out to help but I can't bear to see it. There is so much poverty and famine and disease and illness going on right now. You go there and see and then you live in their midst and they sing songs in their poverty and they rejoice in the, in the fact that they are alive for so many moments. They rejoice that they are not dying today but tomorrow. And they are taking every little thing that they are getting as a great gift. And then I come back to the affluent, healthy societies. And they are miserable in their minds. So I drew up a paper when I was at Harvard here. I said, let me see what makes people happy. It doesn't seem to be the external thing that we see. So I picked up a sample of 1,000 people in Boston and Cambridge area. And questioned them. Some obviously were not so rich. Living in poverty. On the other side of the river. Some were living in great mansions. I took a sample and asked them a question from a questionnaire I had prepared as one of my credit courses. And I asked you what makes you happy? They all said well we should have more money to spend, we should have bigger homes, we should have this thing to make us happy. Then I asked those who had those things which made them happy, are you happy? They said no. Well you got everything, why are you unhappy? A man who had made 10 million dollars, I asked him you said money makes you happy, why aren't you happy? He said I went to school, Harvard Business School. I got my doctoral work there. I did this. I did this. And I made 10 million dollars. But that bum, that neighbor of mine with no education made 20 million. How do you expect me to be happy? <laughs> I realize that happiness is not coming from those things. Happiness is coming from mental attitudes. Here was an experiment I did right here. This mental attitudes. Then I, then I, dis then I dis discovered that I could divide happiness into the perceived happiness from material sources and the perceived happiness from intangible sources. Then I found a strange equation, a mathematical equation that those who have more happiness from material things are more unhappy in the intangibles. And those who are happier in the intangible are unhappy with the material. So, and it seems to vary so that everybody is equal. Very strange conclusion. It was a very scientifically done paper here. But the conclusion was that those who seem to be happy in one direction are unhappy in another. So the whole world is unhappy. Only those are happy who found the truth within. Thank you.